Okay, so let's start. Uh, first, any questions from previous lectures, discussions? Okay, so we'll figure out what this means soon. Okay, so you've been trying to get, how many have you tried so far? So nine times without getting it right, right? Smart guy, it's a hard, very hard problem. This is exactly how hard this is soon, okay, and how this relates to phylogenetics. Okay. <coughs> so, so we're going to talk about phylogenetics. One thing about characters. So characters being sometimes called them ancestral. You could call them primitive, but that's what we don't. Or derived. Taxa. We don't usually say basal or derived. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So phylogenetics. This is what I do. Right? So I have 30 more years of work, then I retire and then die. Right? Why am I choosing to spend it on this? Okay. Well, <coughs> I started from a project when I was an undergrad. All right, so who knows what this is? A beetle. Yep, a bark beetle. And so bark beetles make these galleries with their larvae under wood. Okay, and larvae will go around and start chewing. And some of them eat the wood. Some of them actually are farmers. And the female has these special pharyngea pockets to carry spores. And when she, you know, makes the gallery for her offspring to live in. She also inoculates it with spores, and the spores start growing, and so actually larvae eat fungus, okay. and the fungus eats the wood. Okay. <coughs> and that, I mean, that's a very cool story. But then if we add a phylogeny, we can find out a lot more. Right? So we take that phylogeny and map on where this farming occurs, and we can find out that there are seven origins of agriculture in this group. Okay. So farming, so this farming is a pretty complex behavior. It didn't evolve once, it evolved seven times based on this. Okay. Which you can just tell from using just you know excellent ecological behavioral data and a phylogeny. Okay. <coughs> These also have really weird sex ratios. You might have you know one male offspring and 15, 20 female offspring. Right? And most things we have a one-to-one -one ratio. I'll explain why in, in a little bit in the class. Okay. Um, and the males look very weird. So the females look like regular larvae and then develop to adults. The males have this heavily squatterized head, right? And these jaws for fighting, and there's a like, weak little body, right? And <coughs> what happens is the male mates all his sisters, and then goes to the next gallery, fights off their brother, and tries to mate with all of them, too. Okay? And so it's really cool inbreeding behavior. And we see it's occurred eight times. And often it's similar places as farming. We have some connection between farming and inbreeding, okay, and these beetles. Um, and so we can get those, that correlation from looking at the phylogeny. Okay. We want to see how many, how many species there are, right? So you know, this is a subsample of all the species there are. And we find that those angiosperms have more species than their sister groups, the conifers. Okay. Which suggests that something about eating angiosperms either increases speciation rate or decreases extinction rate or both. And then you can test it out by using the phylogeny too. So before we just had some really cool behavior, we are getting at mechanisms, timing, causes of origins by just taking some excellent data, some DNA, making a tree, and analyzing it. This is a very cool, powerful method. That's why I do it. Right. So any questions about this? Okay. So again, remember, this is a tree. Tree is a series of nestings, right? Um, here we see an actual like population history. It's a very messy process. Right? You have population size changing, you have extinction happening, you have populations getting subdivided and then coming back together, you have gene flow going from one population to another population, you have hybrids forming. Right? Life is messy, stuff going extinct, speciation happening slowly. Right? We represent this as this idealized tree, okay? which misses a lot of the complexity here. And we're working on better methods to give some more of the complexity, like you know, hybridization between that and the tree and things like that. Right? But it's important to realize that the things we're using with phylogenetics are these sort of simplifications of life, of reality. It's a model of reality. Okay. <coughs> Any questions about that? Okay. Um, Phylogenetics is taking off. Right? So probably a few years ago, showing. The blue line is where people that have phylogenetics in them. Okay. Um, and then here we see 
the overlap of evolution, ecology, and phylogenetics. Originally, phylogenetics was just sort of a pimple inside of evolution, right? And now it's overlapping ecology and evolution quite a bit. Okay? We use it in all these different fields. How do you make a phylogeny? Okay. Here's a very, you know, high level quick view. Right? You get, you can look at what you want to study. Right? So I want to say phylogeny of spiders or of um, angiosperms or of primates, something like that. And then you select the genes you want, okay? And you can either get it from a, from a public database, or you can go out and get your own get your own data and combine it. Okay. You filter the sequences in some way. Maybe sequences are somehow known to be contaminated. Um, like that. Make sure the genes are the same gene. Okay. You align, you align the genes. Okay. Make sure that an A here represents an A here versus a T here. And then we do a tree search. We propose thousands, millions of trees and find the tree that best fits our criteria. Okay. And there's different criteria people use and they fight viciously, throw chairs about which criterion to use. Um, sort of settle down a little bit. Those are form little clubs and we talk to each other as much. Right? But very contentious. We're not going to get into that much here. Okay. <coughs> and here you can see sort of the height here shows the number of papers through time. Okay, you can see it's growing. And the colors show those criteria, right? So parsimony, this big red swath, okay? those are papers that say the best tree is that that has the fewest changes on it, right? So I have one tree that says eyes evolved 15 times, and one tree that says eyes evolved once. It's probably the tree that has eyes evolving once is the best tree, so use that one, okay? Um, distance is a tree that minimizes the between taxa. So taxa should be similar, so let's try to make a tree that has a taxa, you know, similar together. Okay, likelihood uses a model of evolution, right? So you might say, okay, yeah, maybe you think eyes evolve infrequently. Something like a single base pair change could happen a lot, right? So you might have a model that has the most probability of having one change versus two changes, but it could be that two changes fits better. Okay, so use a model for that. And that's not. Asian approaches are the same sort of thing, but they also incorporate prior information. We'll talk about that later in the class as well. And finally, there's various miscellaneous things. Okay? That's sort of the growth of different methods. And so for a while there was a vicious fight between this crew and this crew. Right? And now this crew now uses this as well. And so you know, it's, it's complex. Okay? And there's various reasons about philosophy of science as well as performance of the methods that underlie that dispute. Okay? <coughs> so this cartoon. So you get a chance to look at this, right? So here we have a menu of options, right? And we say, you know, like exactly fifteen dollars and five cents worth of appetizers, right? It's addition. It's easy, right? But it's a hard problem. Why? What makes it a hard problem? Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways to combine them. And if I tell you, you know, the answer is, you know, 10 sampler plates, you can say, no. You can verify that's not, not, that's not correct very easily. If I say it's seven mixed fruits, you can say, is that correct? Yes, it is. So you can verify that accurately, right? But finding that solution is hard. There's actually more solutions than that, too. Okay? <coughs> so this is a class of problems known as NP-complete, okay, in computer science. And right now, if you can, if you can show that there is a fast algorithm to solve it, you get a million dollars. If you can show that there is no fast algorithm to solve it, you get a million dollars. Here right now, a big question is, is there an algorithm to solve this quickly or not? It's, it's one of the big questions in computer science, and there's a prize associated with that. Okay. And the phylogenetic problems we're looking at, you know, trying to find out what is the best tree, is a problem of this sort. Okay. I can say, <coughs> there is a tree that has five changes on it. And I can look and look and look and look and not find an algorithm. Finally, boom, I find it. And I can, once I get it, give you a tree, you can tell, tell you, oh, no, that has five changes, that has six changes, that has four changes, right? But finding that tree is hard. And so what we typically do is have a heuristic algorithm, right? Which means, eh, it gets close to the answer, you think, often, not always, right? Which is scary, right? Um, because these are used for, I mean, file junk trees have been used to, to convict people of crimes, right? There's someone who is infecting his patients with HIV, right, deliberately. And, and so they showed that it was, you know, this guy doing it based on the phylogenetic reconstruction, right? 
But if tree search is fuzzy, how do you know this is the right tree? Right? <coughs> and we have, we have ways of testing support and things like that. Right? It would be very much nicer to have a fast algorithm. Okay? And so when you're trying to find the best tree, that can take you know, days, months to find the best tree. Okay? Um, so it's a hard problem. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, and we have some trees available. So right here's a phylogeny of all of mammals. Okay. And it actually doesn't show like the details. It just actually has details of the tips. Okay. What do you think about the resolution of this tree? So remember we talked about polytomies last time? What do you see about this tree? And so some parts are resolved, some parts aren't resolved. And so it could be that they have multiple trees here that conflict. And so they show that conflict, that conflict as a polytone. Right? If they work harder, you know, get more and more data, maybe we can solve that. Um, okay. We can also do trees for other things. Like here's a tree of languages. Okay. Um, so you can see. Ukrainian, Polish, and Russian are pretty good. Right. Um, Irish. Irish, right? That's actually pretty thing. Um, um, French here. Right. Spanish. Catalan. Here. So, if you do a tree of languages, you've done trees of books, right? So. If you're, you know, a monk copying a manuscript, right? You're working long at night, you know, you're drifting off, you make a mistake. The next month, monk to copy your version, you know, copies your mistake as well, and then adds his own, and so forth. And so these history of mistakes lists us actually reconstruct what the earliest copy looked like. Okay, so you can reconstruct literature that way too. All right, so these are used in many, many fields, not just biology. Um, here we see a tree of all life. Okay. Look at the subsample, right? And things like you know, fungi are super diverse, right? Here. Again, I have some stuff coming with fungi. But things that we love a lot, like vertebrates, are all over well sample, right? So that's sort of sampling bias to take into account. But this is a tree that actually does the original branch lines in time. It says that back, you know, 50 million years ago, what was, what was living? Any questions about this? And then one issue for biologists using trees is that you know creating trees like this is hard work, right? So if they've created this tree and you have some other study you want to use the tree for, you have to be able to get it, right? And some trees are shared, and so anyone can you know download a tree and use it for his or her own analysis. Right? And particularly this particular tree though isn't, so you can get the picture of it. You want to actually go in and use this tree for your own analysis and say, let me look at the vertebrates. They don't lie to you. Sort of a weird how science works sort of issue. Can you pay for Nope. Yeah. They have a website you can use to get like two taxes at once. Um, that's it. I know. Um, yeah. And sometimes. Some, some, Not really, no. I mean, it's sometimes, it's sometimes a pain in the neck to share stuff, right? So if I have to deal with a lot of people emailing me, that was an older reason not to share. Now, of course, you can just put it on the website and have websites for this. Um, yeah. yeah. Some people are afraid of people criticizing their work. So we had something published in Nature recently, and someone said, you know, I don't think I like how you coded that. Give me the data, and I'll try it again. And so the data is all available, so you could download it and try tweaking something and see, you know, if I change how it's coded, is, is, are, there, are your results sensitive to it, right? And for us as authors, we might be like, oh, we don't want to be our fair work criticized, right? But for science in general, it's good, right? So you can say, you know, look, your results are very, very particular, and if you change any little thing, it falls apart, maybe. 
right? And so it's good for science to do that, but for me, I don't want to encourage that stuff. I want to get tenure, right? And so this, we have a sort of selfish, selfish reason not to share, but we still share, but other people wouldn't. So that sort of thing too. Yeah. Or if you've spent, you know, if you're a grad student, you've spent five years making a tree. You want to use it for paper one, paper two, paper three. Right, if you use it for paper one, you lease the tree, you can also take your tree and use it for something else, and maybe scoop one of your other papers. So you might want to hold it for that reason too. And so there's you know, many reasons why people want to hold it and not hold it. I think we're afraid people might misuse it. Right? So um, I would treat this, say, bad in some area. Right? I know it's not really real, well certain, certain there. I'm afraid someone might use it for conservation and say, look, these are one species. So we could put, build a parking lot there. Well, you can't really trust that part of the tree. Right? So they may want to have a restriction for that reason. So there's reasons like that. But science is definitely moving towards releasing more, more and more data. Right? And we will pay for science that you must release your data. So it's getting a lot better. Other, other questions about this? Okay. So here's a tree. Uh, this is sort of how big and scary a tree space is. Okay. Um, and how big this, how the, the, the column is. So here's a tree of 13,100 species. Okay. this analysis took 32 weeks of RAM back in 2009, which back then was a lot. Now it's still a lot, but I mean, not that. Okay. So, here's a tree. Okay. And tree space grows fantastically fast. Right? So, <coughs> here we have exponential growth, doubling on a block scale. Right? The linear one on the block scale. Right? That's fast. It's already exponentially. It's a problem. Right? Here's you know, using 10 every unit, right? So if there's like 1, then 10, then 100, then 1,000, right? That's super fast as well. The number of trees grows what we call double factorially. 3, 5, 7, 9. That was worse than exponentially. It keeps shooting up. Okay. And so, you know, here's the number of atoms in the universe, right? And so, you know, we have a tree of you know, 50 facts of it. There's more possible trees for those set of 50 species than there are atoms in the universe. Right? So obviously you can't you know, store each tree in one atom or something. Right? <coughs> so you know, this tree is this huge, huge area. Okay, to search it. And again, we have to use heuristics. We don't know. But we have no way to guarantee you get the right answer. Right? And so for that tree of you know, 13,533 species, okay. The difficulty of that tree search, I'll say, is the size of finding a rubber duck on campus. If I add just two species to that tree, my search space goes from, you know, our already pretty large campus to the entire planet. So, <coughs> so this is why it's a sort of chewy, a hard, very hard problem. Another issue with it is just looking at things can be hard, right? <coughs> Let's say I have 13,000 names. And you don't really care about some of the names. You're going to say, okay, where's a daisy on that tree? Where's my favorite oak species on that tree? Right? Well, if you have, you know, a fancy HDTV, right? you can't put 13,000 names on you know, 2,000 pixels. It's not, not in the room there. Right? The whole bunch of names just one dot on your screen. Okay? Um, if you have a fancy house of computer monitors, this might have to go with my advisor. You have a three by three array of monitors, right? And you can get, you know, high end computer monitors, 3200 by 2000. You can pile those together, get those higher. Still, you can get two of that. And actually, one thing people still do is this, right? Where they <coughs> take trees and they print them out. And this is actually pretty good. It's a better resolution than you know, this does. It's got cheaper too. Um, There's also now ways to like zoom in and out of the tree and that sort of thing. Okay. But the point is that you can just look at these can be hard. Okay, so these are so it's hard to get them, hard to look at them. Why bother? Okay. That's what you should be asking yourself. So here's an example. Here I have five flower species. Let's say they differ in body color and eye color. I want to know what the history is. Okay. And I have a hypothesis here. So the orange ones feed on oranges. So it could be that they became orange 
um, to better feed on oranges. Right? So <coughs> they you know, started eating oranges, and then for camouflage reasons, it's better to be an orange bug on an orange fruit than a purple bug on an orange fruit. Right? Or it could be they're already sort of pre-adapted. They're already orange, and then when they later start, start um, feeding on oranges. Right? How could you get at this? How, how could you study this? Okay. Mm -hmm. like maybe they're not, I mean, you know, orange is a small part of their diet. I suggest it's not the, this hypothesis. Okay. What else? Yeah. So for ancestors, you um, put down these oranges and they put probably all of them. Right. So you figure out their ancestors are orange and right. And so to do that, you need a tree. Or maybe you can get some fossil information that if color doesn't fossilize well, you're out of luck. Sometimes, sometimes color does fossilize if it's you know, color caused by physical properties. Or, but if it's pigment, probably not. Good. All right. So we can use a, a function to get this question. Right? So let's use parsimony right, to minimize changes. So I could take these flies and measure this as a tree. And I could say, <coughs> How many changes would this tree would this this tree create? Talk to your neighbors. What, you know, how many changes of color are required for this tree? Given this mapping of these social states. Wait a minute, given given this mapping, so orange, orange, orange. Given, given the snapping of right. Yeah. Okay, ready? Hold up your fingers, one or two. Yay, good. Two, right? Right there. Good. Is that the most parsimonious reconstruction? One of the fewest changes. So approximately it's cheapness, right? It's the cheapest reconstruction in terms of number of changes. No. Right, what's better? Triple ancestor for all but the orange clade. Right. Perfect. Right. But if it's purple, now this is more parsimonious. And you can change, change there. Okay. Okay. So we can get this history. So now we know about where that happens. So it could happen, you know, get the money here, 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 and then happen down here. Okay. okay, so go back to our hypothesis. Okay, let's look, see if we can figure out when that, how we can answer that. Right? So, first we need to tree calibrate the time. Right, so a chronogram. We're going to the time units. Okay, so let's say it's this. And then if we find oranges evolve here, Does this support or not support our hypothesis? Okay. So. Why? Okay. Okay. Does anyone disagree? Um, <coughs> so it's consistent with hypothesis, right? That you could have evolved orange color because of orange. Does it mean it's true? No, necessarily. Right? You could have evolved orange color because some pigment halfway broke. Right? And that could have been orange. Right? So it doesn't suggest it doesn't say that it must have been that way. But we think about, you know, if it were this kind of tree, right, orange is evolved, then this would definitely suggest our hypothesis is wrong. Right? So here we already are in the So some trees would say, you know, it's wrong. We just say, you haven't shown it's wrong yet. It's very hard to show that it's right. Okay. Yeah. I don't 
Good question. So, right, so, you know, so you say, okay, back to the first one, right? I could have said, you know, well, or just evolve here, you know, I could have had, you know, this reconstruction instead, right? And it only cost one more, one more change. Isn't that good enough? And <clears throat> this is one reason people don't like proximity. It's like, it's just, you know, the number of changes is hard to quantify statistically how much support there is for one versus two. Um, what we would do instead is use a model of evolution. Right? And I think like a simple model of evolution like coin flipping. Right? And you know, have sort of probably getting heads you hear a little bit about <coughs> twice quickly versus getting heads once on a short branch or something like that. Right? Um, and so if you try to use a model of evolution, then you get support and say, you know, ninety five percent of the evidence is towards one flip or one change. Um, and so that was my office is supposed to help positive ninety five percent. Um, it's more complex than that to get it, but, but you can use these models to answer those questions. It depends on the models. So the traditional, like very simple models, we just look at it as you know zero one change. We don't quite care what causes it, and then yeah, we don't take that into account. If you have a more complex model that looks at like the gene pathways leading to this, and you can show that you know these purple ones and this purple one is a different gene pathway, and it can suggest evidence for the two switch model and one. Um, so you can do something like that. So So, this is, so, yeah, this is the most beautiful part. This is the, this is a, so, there is the tree itself, part of the West Point's tree, <coughs> during, in this case, like, other data, like, you got DNA data to get with that tree, and then you have the most proximal reconstruction on that tree of some other character, so we're actually talking about here. But, yeah, so you, you that, right, if you were just using parsimony, I mean, so even there, if you had, if you had parsimony, but you said that, okay, these have gene pathway A, gene pathway A, gene pathway A prime, and gene pathway B, Maybe most of us want to have a change here and a change here. Right. We could just use the gene pathway as the trait. Yeah. And then the best way to explain that pathway is by two changes. Yeah. yeah good question. And so, for example, there was a study that came out uh, early on when I was in grad school that said that stick insects re-evolved wings. Okay, so some of them lost wings and re-evolved them, right? And that's crazy talk, right? And wings are a complex thing. They evolved four times. You're telling me that these, these good insects lost them and got them again. Isn't much more, make more, more sense to have them just, you know, have lost them multiple times, right? Um, <coughs> and so, you know, if you parse my reconstruction, you say, okay, yeah, look, they re-evolved. They re and I tried doing different statistical models of this to say, okay, let's have a prior belief that when it's you know ten times harder to re-evolve wings than to gain them. Let's see if we have that prior belief going into it, we still got reconstruction that shows the re-evolved. Like, yes. Then we had to have a, a crazy like hundred times harder to re-evolve than to um, lose prior belief in order to make it so that they've only evolved once. Okay. And so that's a way you can bring in some of that statistical thinking and look at models that way. I was using a, that was using a Bayesian approach. Okay, so prior plus a model. Okay. Other questions about this? That's good. And one thing I'm not showing you here is that you know this reconstruction business, as you sort of guessed out already, is pretty uncertain. Right? And so even with good models, oftentimes you say, okay, there's a 49% chance it's orange, and a 50% chance it's purple. And it's not a big difference in life. And so there's often lots of uncertainty in the future. Okay. Another thing to worry about is you know, here we have five data points. I'm trying to construct four data points. Right. 
It's not a lot of data to use for estimating these four things. There's no reason why it's uncertain. We were looking at something like rates of evolution. You might have only two rates, rates going from purple to orange, and orange to purple, but you can get more and more tax reports so only two rates to estimate. So that can be a little, a little more robust than estimating all these states. Make sense? Okay. So that's you know one example where you know depending what the tree is, you either end up using black butter. And so it shows what, you know, sort of how this can help you figure out things about the past. Right. Another thing you can do is control for non-independence. Right, so look at these data. What, 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 is this, what does this data tell you? Just talk to your neighbors. And look for like correlations. All right, so what do you think? What does, it, what does this suggest for correlation? What does this suggest for correlation? What would you look for? Yeah. Exactly. Right. So smaller leaves move longer. Does that make sense as a biological thing you see in the world? So I've made this giant, expensive leaf. I'm going to throw it away next week. It's a little tiny leaf. I keep it for years. Seems sort of counterintuitive, right? Um, could there be a problem with these data? Yeah. Yeah. Always. Right? But I mean, there is a trend. I think it's trying to be significant. Yeah. You're right. I mean, it's like diagnosing a trend. Okay. The problem is that species aren't independent of each other. In the same way, you know, we talked about tetrapods having four limbs, like mammals having four limbs and producing milk. Right? It's not that milk makes you produce four limbs or four limbs makes you produce milk. It's evolved once and it's correlated. Okay? And so we can get at that using a phylogeny. We have a phylogeny of plants, right? and then we can start changes on that phylogeny and correct for that. We get this distribution instead, okay? where we show like an increase in lifespan and an increase in decrease size. So, sometimes it's going to be decreasing size, decreasing size. What's actually happened is this one point fragment. Okay. And <coughs> that one point corresponds to this one, this one, this one, and that one. Right? And here I have you know, pine trees and yews and things like that. They're small, have small, longer leaves, needles. Right? And here, I have big short-limbed fringes from leaves, and oak trees and things like that. <coughs> and so what this plot does is it has a bunch of um, you know, pine trees and things like that here, and a bunch of fringes from here, the white and black dots. Right? But you didn't just think the black dots can't really correlation, the white dots can't really correlation. If I put them together, it looks like it. Right? It's all due to this one chain. We're sort of just overcounting it because you know, that same chain is you know, here, 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 here. Right? Whereas if we correct for phylogeny, we have the right answer. But there's no correlation in this case. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Points there. What are the powers to do? Right. <coughs> um, so this helps us get at, you know, Making mistakes because we treat species independent when they're actually not. Okay. So that's nice, don't make mistakes that way. You can also use this as date things, right? So, so called molecular clock. Right? So here's the Hawaiian Islands. So, Hawaiian Islands are cool. You have the Pacific plate moving along, and you have this blowtorch that's melting through the crust, cooling volcanoes. Okay? And, you know, 
Cassiopeia is actually other islands that have been eroded into the sea, right? This one's being created now. There's actually another one down here underwater. It's rising too. So when you know, these islands up here, and you can go quietly or go from this one. This is a good scenario. Um, <coughs> and so we can look at, look at the, the differences in um, amount of changes if you apply to the islands. And if we assume that, you know, apply the top row to the two islands over here, we find this great correlation. We have time of separation of the islands, and then time of, you know, this is to apply a It's very strong correlation. The more time you separate, the more they're different. Okay. We can then use this as for the clock to then date other things. Okay, here, when things happen. Um, we can use these trees to look at things that we have hard to detect anymore. Right? So here we see a tree of dinosaurs the relatives. So most of them are extinct, but most of them are still alive. Right? Birds. And one question is, you know, things that fly typically have small genome sizes. Right? Because DNA is so heavy, and they shrink it. Well, no, it's, I think it's something to do with metabolism. Right? So if you have, you know, strong, faster metabolism, the selection for having more efficient, you know, uh, machinery. And so have shorter, smaller DNA right? <coughs> And so, what they do here, the Constructing um, genome size with smaller being weaker on the cell isomer. Okay. Using a correlation of genome size with cell size, we have a dinosaur. Uh, yeah, you look at the dinosaur the nucleus and count the base pairs. Right? But we can use phylogeny and correlation to phylogeny to start figuring out you know, how big those T Rex's genome Suggests that so dinosaurs, even the ones that couldn't fly, Still had three small genomes. It suggests that you know, they were the probably would have also active and running a lot and things like that before flight. <coughs> we can look at rate differences. Right? So here's the amount of uh, change for woody plants in brown and herbaceous plants in green. Right? Why might they be different? What difference between like woody plants and herbaceous plants? That's the word. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Think about the ease of, ease of, which relates to it. Yep. Yep. Generation time, exactly. Um, and so, <coughs> this says just that you know, woody plants have you know, a year or longer generation time, which makes those be a lot faster than that. And so it could be the amount of molecular change you have relates to your generation time rather than just clock time. Okay. We can get that with this sort of analysis. Okay. We can look at um, movement of gene expression in species. Okay. And so you know, one problem we have with bacteria is they get antibiotic resistance. Okay. And the problem is if one bacterium evolves it, then when it dies, it gets into this DNA, and sometimes other bacteria will pick it up. Oh, this is a cool trait. Let's try that. Um, <coughs> and we can see how that happened over a long time period using phylogeny, phylogeny and figuring out which genes are taken elsewhere. Okay. Little things like whole genome duplications. If you like, you can a period of time when you know, things merge and have their entire genome double, which is cool. If you have twice as many genes, now you can start having genes do different things. Okay. So you can start looking at half of on phylogeny. Um, <coughs> looking at evolutionary correlations. Right, if you're a tetrapod, right, walking on four limbs, it's really great that if you know you have variations such that your front limbs get longer, so your hind limbs, right? So you're not really right? But then that, but in certain cases, that that would be good to have that correlation break, right? So if you're something like you know, Hello Babies, swinging through the trees, right, you just need little landing landing stubs for your legs. But you need your front arms to be able to grow really long. So you can see that you know this correlation between um, arm length and leg length gets lower in the groups. Okay. You know how change happens when you figure that out from the tree. Okay. You can figure out where things used to live. Because they have the species, you can track where they where they occurred back in time. So 
that's going to tell you something like what caused them to speciate, um, what were they adapted to. Are they poorly adapted now for some reason? They don't, do they not do well in cold because their ancestors have never experienced any cold? So they've never had a selection for it. So we have the same thing. We can reconstruct areas from the flat flat back down to time. We can see <coughs> um, how plants evolve with different properties of the environment. Right, so here we can see uh, you know, a high temperature plant group and a low temperature plant group. Right. So they don't differentiate with um, rainfall. Right, so that somehow these are heat specialists, but not you know, dry specialists. Okay. And we get, and using just like current data, you get this, you know, this distribution, this distribution. So any tree, you find out that, oh yeah, it's all of this specific bump that way. Okay. We've also got rates of evolution on trees. So here we see the you know, fishes. And so some fishes eat a variety of different things. Okay. Red basses, yeah, they're just good fish predators. And so you might think that some fishes, you know, to eat different things, you have to have their, their jaws evolve more. Right? You might have like, some, some do better crushing, crushing hard things, some are better eating plants, some are better capturing fast prey. So we can construct rates of evolution and find that, yep, some fishes do have Okay. <coughs> we can look at reconstructing states. Okay. So the biggest flower in the world smells like rotten flesh. Right. It's fly pollinated. Um, and the relatives are tiny flowers. One centimeter tiny flower. And start figuring out where this change happened and how fast. And so they can estimate rates on these branches and figure out, you know, the ancestor here has you know, 25 centimeter um, like, uh, flowers. So we can start that using a tree. It can be used for looking at changes in states and what the order is. So here we see humans, okay, biologically based on the language evolution, okay, and they have different social structures. Right? So they have you know, acephalus, the leader. Mm -hmm. They have complex and simple chiefdoms, so having one leader who follows him or her, and they have complex states, like a hierarchy. Okay. And so we can look at that distribution now. By combining with a tree and constructing, we can figure out how you move from state to state. Okay. <coughs> we really found that you could be moved from one state complexity to a neighboring state complexity. Right. You might to go this way, and you are to hop over directly. Um, you keep going this way, there's always a chance of going all the way back, you know, structure. Okay. Which makes sense. If you think about, you know, you have people sailing new um, islands and new boats. If you land on a small island, you're not going to have your 20 people having a city state. Right? You're going to have to go back to the small So you can always jump back down, but it's hard to go from a set of town, big island, to all the way to the city state. Okay, so you get that with the trade. Things like uh, poison, right? So <coughs> here are fish that you know, have venom and poison. You can see how often they evolve. You can construct that in the tree. Okay. You can also look at diversity, right? So there's a lot of birds. Right? So do birds have a fast speciation rate or low extinction rate? We can find out that you know, some birds do. We need to look at birds, like blue jays and like that. But other birds, like chickens and that, have slower rate. Okay, there's not a single monomorphic, monomorphic rate, it varies. And the probability is to a very low representation rate. Okay, and so not only look at the number of species there are now, but actually how fast they're appearing. Okay. So, we're going to That's what phylogenetics is. We'll keep coming back to it because it's a good way to answer macro, macro evolutionary questions. Okay. Um, what other questions do people have about what, what, what do you think, you know, things you care about biologically that might be in scope for this sort of approach? What do, you, what do you care about? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe if you had a phylogeny, we could get it. What other questions do you have about this? Yeah, 
I'll give you a chance. You have a few minutes. I'll give you a chance to talk talk to your peers. You can bounce ideas off each other. Some people are afraid to share an idea to the whole class. But if you just say it to your neighbor, they can, they can say, "Oh, it's stupid or not." Talk to each other. <laughs> All right, so what do folks think? What ideas did you have? Yeah. Uh, the extinction. The extinction. Okay, what's that? Uh, to exactly. So we have preserved passenger pigeons, right? It used to be like a quarter of all birds in North America were passenger pigeons. Now it's zero. Right? It's gone extinct. Right? They're tasty and they also like if you shot one, the others would circle around and call for their friends. And them all, right? so, um, but we have DNA from them. So if you want to try, try to create a new passenger pigeon, should you stick that DNA into an ostrich, into a chicken, a rock dove, you know, a regular pigeon? And so people have used these techniques to find out what species is most closely related to them. And so there's talk of you know, de-extincting passenger pigeon by putting its DNA in something else. Yeah. I don't know. Probably, probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, nothing's been successfully de-extincted yet. Extinguished. Um, and it's controversial in some circles. You know, why spend money on this rather than on keeping other things from going extinct? Right? That's, a, that's a policy thing, not a science thing. Science thing, you want to know what's relative. Ground slots. For me, I would like to you know, you know, change the genetics of the It's too late for you, but maybe your kids, you can modify your kids. Yeah, I mean, I think you can put them in the place. Maybe, depending on how far off or what certain genes would modify. Yeah, and people actually, those sort of opposite, rather than like trying to modify future offspring, but try to figure out like what made humans, you know, speak so much more than chimps do, right? What genes evolved that affect that? So you can do that sort of thing. Yeah, as well. Yeah. What else? Okay, that's a good answer. That's a great question. So, do things that live longer have slower speciation rates or or, or higher extinction rates? Right? And there could be some reasons for that. I think that that might be the case. It's a good test. And very definitely, like, it's a very practical test, too. Good. What else? Right. So baby jellyfish looks like sea anemones, right? Imagine jellyfish on its head, a whole stack of them. They're called medusas phase. And then they pop off and just float around. And usually what they'll do is produce eggs and new babies. There's at least one species that can go back to the medusa stage. 
And so you can see, you know, when did that behavior, when did that ability evolve? Um, and what what did those relatives do and what sort of led to that? Great. All right, I'll see you all on Monday.